Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Later on the program, we head to Hollywood, where we'll take a look at Tinseltown's latest entry into the world of political satire and remember a true icon of Hollywood's bygone silver screen. But first... Seeing the world through Eileen Uric's eyes, we'll take a look at one of the leading artists of the Turkish Cypriot community. When you look at my work, when you first see them, they don't look like they're in, in our space. They look like they're in a, their own unique, different dimension. But we begin today's show in a special space where seeing is not necessarily believing. They've made otherworldly creatures for Game of Thrones and performed magical acts of illusion in Harry Potter films. And now a group of sculptors are taking what they learned on film sets over the last 20 years and using it to go beyond reality and challenge long-established perceptions. We sent Miranda Atti to meet the hyperrealists, whose work is now on display as part of a special exhibition at London's Opera Gallery. Walter Cossotto's latest work is a giant sculpture of David Bowie's eyes. It's just a fraction of the famed musician's face, yet it's instantly recognisable. It's typical of his style, an ear here, a mouth there, every piece incredibly lifelike and incredibly oversized. Walter's art is inspired by the experience of working on film sets. When I finished you know, high school, I, I wanted to, to know how, you know, the, to get to learn the, the skills, the techniques to do my own art. So that's how I came up with the idea, you know, maybe the, the cinema industry would be the right place for me to learn all of that. And that's what, actually what I did. So um, little by little, I built up my portfolio and uh, I came over here in London and I worked for many different uh, workshops, uh, working for Harry Potter. That was my really first big movie. And then X-Men, you know, Game of Thrones was another one. And uh, yeah, uh, that was really cool because uh, obviously you get to meet very talented artists and that's where I got all the skills to do what I'm doing now. Artists like Walter are known as hyper-realists. They start from a, photo a photo photographic reference, but then they go beyond, they go beyond the reality uh, by emphasizing details and uh, tricking the eyes of uh, the viewers uh, and uh, also questioning the, the perception that they have of the work. Beyond Reality is also the title of the Opera Gallery's exhibition. And for visitors, it's about constantly being tricked. Some of the most unusual pieces are by Marc Sijan, and they're strategically placed throughout the exhibition. I don't know how long it took you to realise that this is not actually a real woman. She's made entirely out of polyester and oil paint, but she definitely had me fooled. Mark Sijan's other work includes security guards and butlers. He wanted to focus on often overlooked members of society and create a tribute to real people. John Humphreys is an expert in special effects and makes sculptures that are disturbingly close to life, including this self-portrait commissioned by Omer Koch. He's brought a series of portraits to the gallery and in every one, he's played with the idea of dimensions. When you work on films, you, you get you ask specific things. I've done a lot of prosthetics, and everything has to be like super real. And basically, that kind of, it, it kind of educates you into, and, and changes the way you see your own finish in work. So you, you get more and more and more refined, because you've got to make something that's got to be absolutely real for a film, uh, then when you come to do your own fine art work, you, your work becomes more sophisticated through, through having that discipline. So it, one, my fine art works help me 
do my film work and vice versa. These artworks are designed to deceive the eye. Creating hyper-realistic art is a painstaking process and one that takes a tremendous amount of skill. But ultimately, it's about more than just being hyper-realistic. It's about being hyper-artistic too and creating work that leaves us questioning everything we know about what our eyes are trying to tell us. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Starting from humble beginnings, Eileen Örek has lived and worked in half a dozen countries. Considered one of the leading artists of the Turkish Cypriot community, Örek's work was about bringing her culture to the world while traveling the globe to experience other cultures firsthand. Many of her paintings are now on display for the first time in Turkey. But as showcases Adil Halim discovered, her work extends well beyond any man-made borders. Aylin Oryk doesn't like to swoop into a country, paint and take off. The Turkish Cypriot artist prefers to live and work in a country to understand the people, their customs and traditions. But she started from humble beginnings. She has created her own way. Uh, you will see from, the, uh, from her design and sketches and patterns that uh, they are very different, uh, that she uses lots of uh, colors uh, from, uh, from Cyprus. Uh, the blues, the yellow, the green, and whatever, uh, whatever she has seen there, and uh, also the orange, that, that she, the orange color, uh, she's uh, using, and exactly, uh, it's uh, it is you you can say that it's from a Mediterranean uh, location, Mediterranean island. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, she has developed her own skills and the unity, the originality of her painting made many. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to prove uh, her works. Born in Lefkosia in 1941, Oryk began painting in high school. She was the first Cypriot artist to receive a scholarship from the Istanbul Academy of Fine Arts. She then went on to continue her education in Paris and Marseille after receiving a scholarship from the French government. Her work describes Cypriot culture in fairy tale fashion through social panorama, rituals, and daily life in Cyprus. But her career choice was often met with roadblocks along the way. It was the year of uh, 1974, uh, during, the, uh, during the war. Uh, she had to come back, and she had to cut her studies, and she had to come back to, to, to be with her family. And, and uh, it was quite a journey uh, where she came uh, with lots of uh, artworks uh, with her uh, back to the island. But the exhibit's curator says those trying times, when she lived in France, Spain, Belgium and the Ivory Coast, helped make her a better artist. And her Africa years are so important for her uh, in usage of color, light, and of course uh, she had to work, uh, she had the chance, the great chance to work with different body colors and uh, so their, uh, their, their social activities, because social activities are, were so important and are still so important uh, for Eileen Eric. Uh, she feels herself as part of the society and she comes up uh, with lots of, um, I have to say, storytelling uh, and uh, using a very, very distinct aesthetic uh, on, on, on top of it. Storytelling is key for Orek, who wants to amplify her community's voice to the world while discovering firsthand the lived experiences of others. Adil Halim, TRT World, Ankara. Still to come on Showcase, consider this glass ceiling shattered. I specialize in those individuals who believe they are superheroes. They're not all superheroes. The third chapter of M. Night Shyamalan's Israel 177 trilogy finally hits the big screen. The vice presidency is a mostly symbolic job. I can handle the more mundane jobs. 
we're seeing bureaucracy, military, energy, and uh, foreign policy. Yeah, right. I like that. From villains to VPs, actor Christian Bell deconstructs the myth of 46th US Vice President Dick Cheney. But before we bring you those stories, here are a few others making headlines. Belgian comic book hero Tintin marked his 19th birthday with the release of a digital edition of Tintin in the Congo. The controversial book by Belgian cartoonist Hergé has long been accused of being racist. Critics say it was wrong to bring out a new edition at a time when far-right parties were on the rise in Europe. Female artists dominate this year's shortlist for the Brit Awards, with performers Anne-Marie and Dua Lipa leading the race. Both are up for four awards each, with Anne-Marie nominated for the Best Female Solo Artist and the Album of the Year, while Dua Lipa nominated in the Best Single and Best Video categories. The Brit Awards are taking place in London on February the 20th. In Syria, hundreds of artefacts from the ancient city of Palmyra are being restored in the National Museum of Damascus after being damaged during the country's ongoing war. Among them is the beauty of Palmyra, a 2,000-year-old bust of a bejeweled woman, is one of the collection's most valuable pieces. You have to protect it. And the first official trailer for the eighth and final season of Emmy-winning drama Game of Thrones has been released. HBO announced that the last six episodes of the long-running fantasy epic will begin on April the 14th. It's all because I couldn't love a mother. The third installment of M. Night Shyamalan's East Rail 177 trilogy, Glass, opens this week, concluding a filmmaking journey 19 years in the making. But unlike most superhero versus supervillain movies we're normally used to, Shyamalan's latest is not only based in reality, but takes a unique angle on a well-known genre. The three of you think you have extraordinary gifts, like something out of a comic book. <laughs> I've developed an effective treatment for this disorder. <coughs> the light will force a different identity to take over. The cast were out in London last week for the premiere of the film Glass. Joining them on the white carpet was director of the film, M. Night Shyamalan, who explained his reasons for going back to a world he created two decades ago. Reflecting a lot, you know, on the career and, you know, the, the, these characters over the 19 years that I've written are in one movie. Um, it, it, it was almost like I didn't want to make it for 15 years and then started to open my mind up to, hey, you know, let's go back to those characters and finish telling those stories. Hey, pardon me, sir. I think you have the wrong car. Split, made two years ago, was a critical and financial success. Costing $9 million to make, it ended up earning $280 million worldwide. And after directing a number of underperforming films in the previous decade, Split gave Shyamalan's career a much-needed boost. Split's lead star James McAvoy played a man with 23 personalities and who was about to surface his most deadly 24th. Split's ending reintroduced audiences to Bruce Willis's character from the film Unbreakable, the first film in the trilogy. The beast. I believe comic book heroes walk the earth. Willis's appearance exposed the fact that both films were set in the same cinematic universe and introduced the possibility of a third chapter in the East Rail 177 trilogy. Shyamalan initially conceived Unbreakable as a trilogy, but the idea was shelved after a poor performance at the box office. I always thought Elijah was unfinished business. Um, that when Unbreakable ends, you know, we know that he's uh, put away. Uh, but what happens when he is put away? Uh, and Knight promised that it was part of a trilogy. And I've been waiting on the other two films to happen. My name is Patricia. As we all know, the third chapter did get the green light. 
So what did the antagonist of the film have to say about reprising his split personality role? It's coming any minute now for you guys. Playing one character in a movie can be tricky. You've got to do a lot of preparation, so doing that 20 times is, is, is not necessarily normal. Uh, so it was a bit of a scramble. It was like cramming for an exam that you forgot was coming, you know? It was a bit like that all the time. Finally. Audiences are anticipating a great showdown for this closing chapter of the franchise. But until then, the director's comment may be an indication of who might be standing with the credits roll on Glass. The funny thing is, I don't know why I feel like Mr. Glass would somehow win. What have you done, Elijah? Let's turn now to film reviewer and content creator Wendy Lee to see why she gives Glass a thumbs up to this highly anticipated yet much criticized movie. Hi Wendy, welcome to Showcase. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So, you tweeted that you really enjoyed this movie, which many critics shunned, to be honest. What exactly do you like about it and why are you giving it a thumbs up? Well, for me, um, being that it was an M. Night Shyamalan movie and I quite enjoyed his last film, The Visit, I wanted to go in this and I really wanted to enjoy it. So I didn't put too much, I didn't put my expectation bar up too high. I wanted to go in to be optimistically cautious because if you know uh, Shyamalan's filmography, some are hits and some are misses, but I... In preparation of this movie, I did watch Unbreakable and Split before screening this movie, and it kind of built up my excitement for it. And before the movie started, I just reminded myself it is a movie, it is entertainment, and it is 19 years in the making, and I just let myself enjoy the ride, and I did very much so. I thought, especially the performance by James McAvoy, it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But a lot of critics think that it's a, it is a miss. Why so? Why is it being criticized so much? I think one is their anticipation. I think a lot of people are very much looking forward to this movie, to Glass, because, again, it is 19 years in the making. A lot of people enjoyed Unbreakable. A lot of people really liked Split. And because of Split, the way it ended, no one was expecting it. So we were just kind of going along this journey. And it's good up until the reveal at the end where you see David Dunn sitting in the sitting in the cafe watching the news and you go oh my gosh he's looping everything back in to the original into and making it a trilogy so i think one um their expectation was pretty high which is natural and two the movie it's not without its flaws i thought the first act started off really really strong and they had me hooked from the, from the beginning but as we go into the second and third act we started to see characters being used as um, they were there were a lot of expositions in this movie and instead of it uh, so it become unnatural for the storytelling in that way where you're having a character just telling you a story instead of doing it through a natural dialogue mm -hmm. and what direction do you think uh, Shyamalan is taking in his career because in Forbes magazine Scott Mendelson says that he may have lost his empathy and compassion and his storytelling mojo. Do you agree with that? Where do you think his wow. career is going to? I think Shyamalan is starting to, I don't want to quite say reinvent himself, but I, I, I believe he's found that spark that, we, that he had when, he, we, when we first saw The Sixth Sense and Signs, and he's starting to slowly come back to that. And we saw that when we watched The Visit, because I really didn't know what to expect. I... I remember seeing uh, before that it was Airbender and The Happening and maybe The Devil that he produced. And I didn't like any of those films. And I, and I started to lose faith a, as a fan because I really did enjoy his earlier films. And The Visit kind of, uh, uh, kind of reignited my, my excitement for Shyamalan movies because he's got an interesting way of storytelling. There's always a bit of a twist in his movie. So when one watches his movie, you're always looking for what is the twist be? And I think for the most part, this is not always, um, for the most part, you don't see it coming as, as something in Sixth Sense. So I think he is slowly coming back to his original way of filmmaking to surprise the audience and also making his films now really for the audience that, that are there for his movies and his way of storytelling. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Wendy. I'll make sure I'll see Glass to make up my mind about this. Thank yes. you so much for the great insight. Thank you for having me. Let's stay in Hollywood, where lately there has been an upsurge in political biopics, Chopper Quiddick and Darker Sour being just two examples. But the personal stories of US Senator Ted Kennedy and former UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill didn't manage to have a strong impact on film audiences. But now, a new film about the life of former US President George Bush Jr.'s right-hand man is striking a different note, with the film being more about the mechanics of bureaucracy than straightforward biography. Alijan Pamir shows us how. What do you say? I want you to Vice, the story of the enigmatic 46th vice president of the United States could have been little more than a list of Dick Cheney's more notable antics, like his involvement in the accidental shooting of a 78-year-old attorney, or the private meeting he had with President Bush to express his eagerness to assume executive responsibilities over energy and foreign policy, jobs he describes in the movie as mundane. Instead, those instances are seamlessly brought together to paint a bigger picture of Cheney's life. Christian Bale's performance subtly and slowly reveals Cheney's calculating nature, and it soon becomes evident who actually has control of and power over the government. We're living in these times right now worldwide where we're not exactly sure where power is coming from. Why are things changing? Who's influencing things? And, you know, we all knew about Dick Cheney. I knew he, you know, was an influential vice president. But when I started reading about him, I couldn't believe the degree to which he was controlling things during that time. And then when you really look at the fallout of his eight years in office, how much he changed the course of history. And then the third thing was I realized I didn't know anything about him. I realized I just knew he shot a guy in the face. That was about it. Um, so suddenly we had a mystery on our hands. While the film answers the all-important question about who really holds the power, it also raises a more vital one. Do those holding the power use it responsibly? This is a man who, 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 who wielded world power. Right? I mean, I spent months trying to understand what that must feel like, and I really don't think I could ever come close, truly, to understanding what it's like just to wake up every morning knowing, yep, I have that, I have that uh, power within my grasp. That's just something unfathomable, uh, um, and uh, uh, by contrast, I'm just a little bing, you know, I mean, he, um, he's a thick-skinned individual, I don't think he's gonna give a damn. <laughs> The film is also thought to be a real critique of the current U.S. government. And the media outlets say the actions of the movie's subject helped pave the way for today's America. We can make this work. <laughs> Hot damn. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. But before we wrap up, let's remember a legendary Hollywood actor whose name will be forever linked with one of the most iconic movies to ever grace the silver screen, Casablanca. Whether playing a nightclub owner with a shady past or a gangster with a heart of gold, Humphrey Bogart will always and forever be a true Hollywood institution. I'm Elif Ketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. What were you saying? I'm telling you for your own good, man, T. They know where you're heading, they picked up your trail. And they'll get you. What's the matter with you, dude? Do something! Shut up! Shut up! Give me time to think! Join us in a glass of beer. The cops ain't likely to catch up with us, not tonight. So we can all be quiet and peaceable and have a few beers together and listen to the music. And not make any wrong moves. Casablanca, city of hope and despair, located in French Morocco in North Africa. I was willing to shoot Captain Rhino and I'm willing to shoot you. All right, Major, you asked for it. Any price you want, but you must give me those letters. There's no deal. All right, I tried to reason with you. I tried everything. Now I want those letters. 
Get away from my burrow. We can sell those burros for just as good as prices you get. Get away from my burrow, I tell you.